to the massive impact, social media and technology are having on the notary industry. The rise of the smart notary is in full effect. Are you prepared for the inevitable changes or will you become obsolete? Nationwide notary agency owner Tiger Toledo shows you exactly how to leverage opportunities that currently exist. Through real-life examples, personal stories, insight, and examples, Tiger shares how he took his small one-man traveling notary service to a nationwide success using the same technology available to you. Rise of the Smart Notary will teach you how to take advantage of today's opportunities. Provide strategies and tips for using social media. Breakdown of the traditional way versus the new way of doing business. How you can exploit the opportunities that exist today. Tiger will also teach you how to work smarter not harder. Explain top mistakes notaries make with their business. Provide immediate steps you can take towards success. Grab your copy today. It will change your life. Peace, peace, peace. This is your international sales and marketing hit, man. Tiger Toledo, and you already know what it is, man. You rock it with the best. You heard? You guys are meeting my coach. I, I call them my, my soul side, my chapo. That's who there I can wait from. Huh? El jefe, el chap, chapo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get so many inquiries. People asking me, hey, how do I roll out my book? How do I get my book on Amazon? And... As far as that is concerned, I got some knowledge, but you guys need to meet the person that I got the knowledge from. He is the person, my sensei, that who I, I turn to, and thank goodness he rolled out the program. Um, because if Donnie Bryant did, it was Donnie Bryant that introduced me and said, hey, you need to go check out this guy, Ty Cohen, dude. Like, wow, he, he's the real deal. And I said, all right, let me, I said, if Donnie's going to recommend him, I'm over there. I saw it. He was a melanated brother. I was like, "All right, where do I sign up?" <laughs> hey, sometimes that makes that makes it even better, right? You're like, "Okay, all right." So somebody that could relate. And then I, I I researched your story, and it was your story is amazing because it's kind of similar to my background. I call it you come from an era where I call it under twenty one. So mm -hmm. a lot of us didn't think that we would see the age of twenty one. We would either yep. be locked up or killed. You know what I mean? Like something yep. bad would happen. So if you reach the age of 21, it was almost like, ah. Uh... So can you tell people a little bit about like your, your upbringing, Ty? Because I love Yeah, absolutely. Story. You know, and I, I, I kind of never heard anyone position it the way that you just positioned it, right? But as you were saying that, I was thinking back to when I was 17 and 18 and 19 and hit 21. Like, as sad as that sounds now, that was a milestone for us, right? And for so many people, that was because I never thought that I would live to uh, see 21. Um, mm -hmm. I actually kind of didn't think that I would live to, to see about 17 or 18. Um, mm -hmm. and I grew up in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And sometimes, you know, before, not so much now, because I think people have, has, have maybe... People that are from the Northeast, right? They know about the history of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, but before I would say, hey, grew up in Connecticut and people would think, Connecticut, man, what, what's out there, right? Cows and farmland and pasture. And I'm like, Connecticut was very interesting. It was a, a, a place where based on the city that you lived in and oftentimes based on the side of town, you didn't have dreams of growing up and living past 22 or past 23 because you've seen so many people in the environment, so many of your friends, your relatives, Right. Your associates that unfortunately didn't make it. I remember seeing one of my best friends, not seeing him, but having one of my best friends get killed at 17 mm. on his bike by someone else. Right. That was an enemy of his. So that was the reality that we that we unfortunately grew up with. I think that. That becomes an advantage at the time when we're going through it, we may not see it. But later in life, it becomes the advantage for us. It becomes the, one of these things where the, the more adversity you have sometimes, and it comes in different forms, right? The mm -hmm. adversities that you have 
uh, it makes you stronger. Like it makes you so much more prepared for what's out there, the things that you'll see as you get older in life and the obstacles that you overcome, especially if you're really trying to do something. Yeah. Right. So if you're really trying to do something, if you have aspirations to really build up your family, if you have aspirations to be one of the first in your family to, to go to college, right? Or one of the first in your family to have a, a long lasting marriage. Like mm-hmm. those things take time because you're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have obstacles that come into place. And if you are an individual who have, if you've had a, a life that was too sweet, chances are when you hit a roadblock, you, you, you're probably not going to know how to deal with that. It's yeah. going to be tough, right? We see so many people that have amazing lives and, you know, when they, they come across something that's difficult to deal with, they don't know how to handle it. Mm-hmm. Right. You look at someone like Robin Williams, the comedian, this guy was at the, yeah. he was at the top of the globe, right. Had the fame, had the fortune, had the, had, had the lifestyle. Everyone loved him, but deep inside he had the depression and he didn't know how to deal with things. And he didn't know, you know, how to say, okay, well, damn, this, this day, this week, this month, this year is crazy. But I know tomorrow is going to be better, right? So, so growing up, man, I I, I went through a lot of things. Um, I was born in five, raised in Fiverr Panic Village, which at the time was one of the worst housing projects on uh, or in the United States. Hmm. Um, it actually got demolished because it was so bad that police would be afraid to go in there. Um, we had a uh, state trooper that was killed in there. And I'm not saying all of this to glorify it, right? Because I don't think that this stuff is cool or, or, right. or anything at all. But I am just showing you that no matter where you come from and no matter what the obstacles are, if you just hang on, there's so much past that. That is a beautiful thing. I'm actually here in Philadelphia right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm not at home. Um, I'm, I'm here and uh, went to go visit my aunt and um, go visit uh, a couple of my cousins who live in North Philly and who were born and raised in North Philly. And North Philly, we were talking about this the other day, is one of those areas where you would drive down the street and every third house was boarded up at one time. Yeah. Right? You you saw crack addicts and heroin addicts on, on the corners. And so we were just having this gratitude session for being able to come through that especially as young black males to come through that. And we're all, you know, in our thirties, our forties, you know, and being able to, 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 to look back and say, we didn't succumb to that. And instead we were able to go past it and now be um, this inspiration for other people that might be going through it right now. I got a question. So for the younger generation that are watching this and they are in the inner city, right? The city within the city um, yep. where there is a lot of crime. There's a lot of drugs, prostitution, stuff like what, what can you tell them or how are you able to get out of that? Because it engulfs you, right? Like peer pressure is heavy. Um, if you start thinking this way and your whole crew is doing this way, you get ostracized very quickly. You might even get bullied, picked on. Um, yeah. What would you tell a young kid that's actually like, look, man, I know my life isn't destined to be here forever, mm-hmm. but I don't see a way out. Yep. Man, that's a great question. So I often think about that, right? Because I was that person that, mm-hmm. you know, my, my whole crew would smoke weed. My whole crew was into things right and i was into some of those things as well but Mm -hmm. one of the things that i'm most proud of like i I never at that point i didn't smoke weed i didn't um start drinking or anything like that at a younger age um and i would always get tested right i would always get tested and and i recently had a, a a buddy of mine who got out of jail Mm -hmm. and this shows you how the the paths can be so different Right, me and this guy, we hung around every single day, day in and day out. And he uh, got out of jail a couple of years ago and he had uh, reached out to me, called me up, his name was Goldbucks. Um, and he said, Ty, you know what, man? At the time, 
I couldn't say it, but I always admired the fact that you wouldn't take the blunt and hit it. Like the fact that you you wouldn't turn up the Hennessy or the E&J, right? I, I admire, and this is a dude that was the thuggest of the thuggest, right? Um, yeah. From the outside looking in. And the fact that he now, as a grown man, as an individual, was able to say, I always admired that, but I didn't know how to articulate it. Yeah. I didn't know how to, to say, you know what, tie, tie the way that you're doing it is the right way. And to the younger individual that's looking, I would say that people recognize your greatness, right? Even if you don't recognize your greatness at the time, people recognize your greatness. They may not know how to say it. They may not have the courage to say it to you. It, this was a guy that would go in and take the hammer out and, and shoot at someone else and had that courage to be able to do that, but he didn't have the courage to say, Ty, you're walking the right path. Stay with Man. me. Like, think about that. Wow. Right, think think about that. Like, he didn't have the courage to say this. So I, I, I say to the person that's watching this or to the young individual that might be caught in that crossfire, listen to your heart. Because at the time, I always knew that because I was in that environment, I always knew that 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 wasn't where I would end up at. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have any idea as to how I would get out of it. Me and my wife talk about this often because she came from a very, she came, we actually grew up in the same town. So she came from the same, same, uh, same environment. And she always talked about, hey, I, I knew that, you know, living in Bridgeport wouldn't be my end all or be all. Like, I wouldn't be 30, 40, 50 and still here. Mm -hmm. um, so I say that if, if you have any inkling or any desire of doing something different, listen to your heart and try not to figure it out too tough because mm. just, just listen to yourself and don't, don't try to find the answers, right? Don't try to find the answers because the answers will come to you as soon as you start to really make the decision that this is not going to be it for me. Uh -huh. As soon as you make that decision that this is not going to be it for you, you'll start to see other things that happen. Like the path that I'm on right now and the path that I walked, I would have never imagined it to be that laid out for me. Would have never thought that that would have been um, the path that I would, I would have taken. And it also wasn't a direct path. So it will never be a direct path. Like I have visions of uh, back when Bad Boy and Death Row and, you know, <laughs> everybody else was starting their record companies and they were flourishing. I thought I was going to be your next masterpiece. So I had a record company and I thought that that was going to be the outlet. I thought that was going to be the vehicle. Yeah. Didn't work out. Then I started to do other things that I thought were going to be the vehicle didn't work out but all of those experiences led me to where i'm at and where i'm at now will lead me to where i'm heading to. indeed right so so just being able to be there and trusting the process and understanding that where you're at right now as long as you understand that this is not where you're going to end up like that's the starting point for you right there um, the other thing is just having the courage like having the courage because people admire courage like if you if you think about it, the the people that are the, the most confident, that are the most courageous, are the people that attract other individuals. And the thing about that is, you could be the introverted person. You could be the person that may not be the most confident. You could be the person that may suffer from imposter syndrome every once in a while, because we all do. Yeah. You could be the person that may not think you're the most charismatic. But that, but realizing that, like, that's not always you. There's times where you have ebbs and flows, where there's times where you're in your environment and you are, like, the most confident because you're in your place of security. You're in your place of where you know that what you're doing, no one else is, is, is greater than you at that. You take Jordan, right? When he was on the basketball court, he had the utmost confidence. Yeah. But if you take him and you put him in the garden and you say, hey, Jordan, so this, and I'm using a garden example because my wife has been having us gardening lately. So I got gardening on my mind. And when I'm sitting there gardening, and she's over here smiling. I'm like, man, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing over here. I'm not in my place of comfort. I'm not in my place of confidence. Right? So that's her zone. She's moving in it, and I'm barely doing anything. Yeah. Or what I am doing, I think that I'm screwing it up. So I, I ask that 
the one of the things that I think that as a young individual you should do is you should kind of familiarize yourself with as many different things as you possibly can so that you get exposure to all of the different possibilities. And the beautiful thing about that is now you got podcasts, you got YouTube, you have shows like what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So you can go in and for an entire week, you can go in, you can study cryptocurrency, like totally submerge yourself in it. Yeah. For the next week, you can go in, you can study Kindle publishing. The next week, you can go in and study short-term rentals, right? So there's, the, the next week, you can go in, you can study listing, buying and, and selling cars and listing them on Toro or, or, or a rental for hire site like that. Until you find a thing that resonates with you, you find your lane and you're like, okay, this is what I like. This is the thing that I'm going to move forward on. You know, when we were coming up, it wasn't as easy to get exposure to a bunch of different things, right? Because we didn't have the YouTube. We didn't have the Instagram. We didn't have the Facebook. We didn't have the Tiger to lead off, right? So I think that the, the there's two things that help people to grow more than anything. The mm -hmm. first is getting exposure, mm -hmm. right? Getting exposure. And that was one of the biggest things for me was the exposure. Um, and then the second thing is being able to travel. Okay. So the most dangerous environment when I was growing up in Bridgeport was being on my side of town. Hmm. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. The safest thing for me growing up when I was coming up was being on my side of town. Being on your block. Most, on my block. The most dangerous thing was for me to go four or five blocks up. Yeah. Or from, I, I grew up on the east side, right? So we had the east side, we had the east end. So if I was on the east side and sometimes on the east end, I was okay. But as soon as I went over to the West End or to, we had uh, another project called PT that was on the West End. I went over there and it's unfamiliar territory. Yeah. So you got to watch yourself. If I went over to the South End, right? It was a little bit different. If I went over to the North End, they were kind of soft. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, the North that much. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving my wife a hard time again because her family is from the North End primarily. <laughs> But once I started to go to another city, 15 minutes away, then I totally saw different things. Like I saw different houses. I saw different neighborhoods. I saw people living less stressful. Mm -hmm. And this was taking a bus ride to another city, right? This was, um, as I got, when I got a car, driving to another city. And being able to change your environment and look around and, and say, are you serious? Like people are living like this? Yeah. Right? And now that gives you insight as to what's possible for you. So one of the things that I like to do for our children is we'll take them to other states. We'll take them to other countries, right? We'll travel with them because you get to see different cultures. You, do, you get to see different ways of living, you get to see different ways of thinking, ways of being. And then that now lets you know that where I was living at before was my personal bubble. That was my personal reality as to what life was like, mm -hmm. right? Everyone was on welfare. Everyone had gotten food stamps, right? Everyone was struggling. Everyone had um, a major crisis if their car needed a hundred dollar repair, right? That was like a big deal. Yeah. Everyone, you know, hated one mm -hmm. another. Everyone, you know, so once you get out of those little bubbles, then you start to see more exposure. So I think that travel, man, even if it's travel, like to the next city, the next state, right, the next side of town um, is big. And then as you get some resources, being able to push that and then, um, you know, saying, hey, this is not me. This is this is not where I'm limited to. And you're right, because uh, because I'm originally from New York. When I moved to Chicago, I saw a whole different world. It yeah. was, and, and it was interesting because I, I had cousins that lived here that didn't see Chicago the way I saw it. Mm. So I came in as, I guess you could call it a tourist. And they yep. was like, man, I'd lived here. Oh, eh, that's nothing. But a lot of them didn't never even been downtown Chicago. Yeah. Like, how did you live here all your life? And you've yep. never even been downtown the same way there would be people in Brooklyn that never went to the Statue of Liberty. Staten or, Island or... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. If, if you get a chance to travel and travel outside of your state and, and mm -hmm. stay there for a while, it's so important. It gives you a whole different view on things. 
So like, and, and oh, not, yeah, not to interrupt you, but so I, I saw like, as I started to get a little bit older, um, I'm, I'm at now at this time, mm -hmm. I'm about 18, 19. Right. And um, I'm, I'm getting a little bit older and I'm starting to observe that a lot of my buddies, a lot of my friends, they never really even ventured to the other side of town much. Right. Like that would be three or four times a year that they would go. And I'm talking about a 20 minute distance. 30 minute distance, right? To the other side of town. So if you think about that, like if you were just in this small radius of where you live, everything looks the same. You're really limiting your exposure, your mental exposure, right? Your exposure to things. Someone else comes in there. You, we see this all the time. Developers come into our neighborhoods mm -hmm. and they see <clears throat> what can be. Right. They don't see it as it is. They see what can be. We were driving around uh, Philly, North Philly the other day and we're seeing we're just saying the gentrification taking place. We're seeing like what used to be the brownstones and the areas where the crackheads and the heroin addicts were at are now half a million to million dollar homes. Right. Whereas yeah. before the city couldn't give them away for 10 bucks, a thousand bucks, you couldn't give them away. But so, these developers have come in and they see the possibility was versus the people that were there all along that lived there for decades couldn't see what was possible for. Them. You know, Jay Z kind of talked about that, right? He in, in uh, one of his songs, he says, "You know, I had the opportunity to go in and buy land in Dumbo, yeah, right. <laughs> That's now worth like twenty million. How do I feel, Dumbo? Right. <laughs> and he that's one of my favorite that, lines too." Yeah, man. He said he took that same money and he was putting it into cars and things like And I'm a car fanatic, right? I, I like cars. So I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir now. But but he says, you know, he was he, he had the newest Benz. He had the newest 600. He had the newest five all the time. And he could have taken that same money and put it to something that would have grown exponentially. Yeah. You know, versus. Yeah. So. And, and that's why he buys all the, uh, the Basquiat uh, paintings now. Yes, yes, the Basquiat's and and now he realizes his influence to the point where I can go in and buy these paintings and expose them to the world because you have people like the Grant Cardones, you have people that are in corporate that look up to Jay Z. It's crazy how that thing switches, right? Yeah. So now they're looking at him. He's the major influencer, and now he's talking about Basquiat's, and he's driving the prices up. Yes. You know, influence, so. man, influence is huge. Yeah. So, like, big time. You went, you went. So, I, I wanted to give the backdrop so people understand, like, your journey through this thing, mm -hmm. right? And it, you know, mm -hmm. I like to make the interviews like conversational. Like, we're just it's just me and you, and everybody gets to be a fly on the wall, kind of like, oh, for real, that's how it happened. Smart, so I love that. Went, you went from, you went from the hood. Let's let's call it the ghetto, right? Yep. You came from the ghetto, and then, if I'm not mistaken, you got into the corporate world, right? Yes. Yep. So how yep. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> so man, my my I had only one true job in my life, and that okay. was working at Walgreens Pharmacy. So I got that job. My mom was super super smart, right? Mm -hmm. Um, no college education or anything like that, but she was just super super smart. Shout out to so mom. she. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And she knew that she had to get her son. Sports was not my fame. Mm -hmm. Right. So sometimes we could take someone, we could put them into sports. Right. And that, that keeps them away from the other activities. So she knew that, all right, my son, Ty, Ty he's not the most athletic. I got to get him into something else. So, so at 14, I got my first job and I was working for Walgreens Pharmacy. They had this youth um, program. I forget what it was actually called. It was uh, a program where at 14, you could start working uh, during the summer. Mm -hmm. So I started working there my first year at 14, Walgreens. They loved me. Um, I went back the next year at 15. And then the next year at 16, they officially hired me. So now I was able to work way past just the summer months, right? Um, and then I kind of worked my way up, man. I, I started as a... Uh, cleaner i would clean the bathrooms i would clean the floors and everything else and then i went uh, from cleaner to stock person and then from stock person to assistant manager and then from assistant manager to manager up there and then um 
So, so that being the first job that I had, mm. it kind of kept me away from as much foolishness as I possibly could have gotten in. I still gotten into a lot of foolishness, okay. right? But it prevented me from getting in as, as much foolishness because I started to understand that if I can put this time in and get paid, I can now take that money and put it into other things that I was interested in that would make me more money. Okay. So initially I put it into some things that were not uh, the right things to put it into. Um, and that didn't really work out for me well. And I had this interest in comic books. So I started investing money in comic books. Right. And from there, I started saying, man, I could buy comic books that were priced at five bucks and then sell it for seven bucks. I used to do that too. <laughs> Are you serious? So we got more similarities than, than oh, we it's know, Oh, it's crazy, man. dude. Yep. And we got more similarities than we know. So now the, the way I got into comic books was because I was born with sickle cell anemia. So I would me be in too, the hospital again. a lot, right? <laughs> so that's it. You, you just reminded me of that. I kind of totally forgot about that part of my history right there for a second. But being in the hospital a lot, right? So my mom, again, super freaking smart and intuitive, would bring me comic books so that I could read. She would bring me books so that I could read as I, went, as I was in the hospital, and it would keep my mind off of pain. It would keep my mind off of the, the, the boredom of being in the hospital for days or for weeks on end, mm -hmm. right? So that got me to the point where I just love reading. I would just pick up anything, man. I would read like Woman's Digest. I would be reading, you know, mm -hmm. after I ran out of my comic books, I would be reading, you know, um, just anything that I could find that was in 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 that hospital room or that were in uh, the children's sections or wherever it was, in the waiting rooms. I would be roaming around the, the, the hospitals with my little... Um, with my drip, sometimes I had like a, a morphine drip and, you know, the IV drip and I'm walking around the hospitals with this thing, snatching magazines up and books, you know, from other patients' rooms. So uh, being able to, to have that love for reading took me to a point where I said, okay, there's money in some of these comic books here. Mm. If I can find a buyer, just like I was able to find a buyer when I was selling drugs, I could now provide someone with something that gave him hope, that gave him entertainment, and that gave me cash. Really? So it was, yeah, man, it was about 17 or 18 where I understood the exchange for value. Where I understood that if you give someone enough value, right, value in the form of education, value in the form of entertainment, value in the form of being able to uplift them, value in the form of teaching them something that they uh, wanted to know, but didn't know at the time, they would happily give you money in exchange for that. Hmm. Right. So selling comic books and then later action figures became one of my first businesses. And it was the most beautiful, most um, fun thing ever, because I couldn't believe that here I am. I'm this kid that's in the ghetto. I'm in this kid that's in the hood. And I've got these attorneys, I've got pharmacists that are buying comic books from me. Because by this time, I started advertising in specialty magazines. I started running wait, small wait, little wait, businesses. Wait. So you started advertising? Yeah. Dude, I started advertising. I started reading up on copywriting, studying guys like Gary Benzabinga, guys like Gary Halbert, guys like Dan Kennedy. Wait, how right? old were you at the time? At, at this time, I'm like 18. All right, so at this time I'm I'm eighteen. You knew about copywriting at eighteen? I wouldn't say I, I knew I knew about it, but I wasn't the best at it, right? But it got me enough to sell. Wow. It got me to a point where I could take my hundred bucks that I was making at Walgreens, you know, and flip that into five hundred dollars, and that's all I needed to be able to know. To be able to 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 have for me, what was even more exciting at that time was the fact that I found other people that loved what I love. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm in the hood. Keep in mind, I couldn't go out to the corner and be like, Hey bro, let's read these comic books. Right. You know, I couldn't say, you know, that wasn't working. So to find other people that I could talk to on the phone that also loved Spider-Man or, you know, the fantastic four, I was a Marvel guy. I didn't do DC too much. Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> 
and to get paid for it, like that was the ultimate right there. So that was my first exposure to, to business right there is being able to provide value and, and um, to, to, to give an exchange for the currency that you were after and understanding that, you know, the biggest aha moment for me was that realizing that there were billions of people on the planet and that even though I was just reaching a small amount of people at the time, all I had to do to make more money was figure out how to reach more people. Hmm. So I, I forget how I came to that, but it was something I was reading and it, it was like National Geographic and it just said to me like, you know, there's seven or eight billion people on the planet and the light bulb just went off. I'm like, oh my God, I'm advertising in this one magazine. Imagine if I have advertised in two. Imagine if hmm. I advertised in three. Imagine if I went from having a business card size ad, which is what I was advertising, that was the size. So it was about this size. I said, imagine if I go to an eighth of a page from a business size, size, right? So this cost it 40 bucks at the time to advertise. 40 mm -hmm. bucks would make me about 500. And then if I go to an eighth of a page, which is I think was about 90 bucks. And then from there, I went to a quarter of a page. I went to a half of a page and to a full page. Right. Because I started to understand that the more people that I could reach now, the more money I could make, the more visibility, the bigger it seemed like my company was. Right. So I'm now going in, I'm buying PBX numbers, which were um, PBX numbers, basically a toll free number. You can go in, you could buy a toll free number and then you can re reroute that toll free number to your phone. Mm hmm. So I would go in and buy and it drove my mom nuts, right? Because I, I bought this 800 number and I rerouted it to our house phone. It, there wasn't the cell phone thing at the time. So she would answer the phone and people were like, hey, did I reach Planet Toys? That was the name of my company at that time. Wow. Right? So I'm, re, I'm redirecting and I'm talking to different people. I'm taking orders by the phone, I'm taking orders by fax which shows you how old this was. I would go to sleep, man, and wake up in the morning sometimes and I've had people from as far as Japan that would fax in orders with their credit card information and everything. And I'm thinking, I don't know if these people realize where they're faxing their information to, right? If they knew that they were sending this over to this house that was in the middle of the hood, right? You would probably wouldn't be so gracious with faxing your, your, your credit card information over. But, you know, I, I was doing the right thing with it, had a lot of fun, made a lot of money, and it made a lot of mistakes didn't know what I was doing, didn't have a path to follow, but it, it took me along that journey of being able to start a business up. So you was the original Amazon bookstore. <laughs> Man, there books. you go. For comic books. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Right? So, I, I, I didn't go that route. I mean, like you took it like five levels higher than what, you took it global. Yeah, man, I, I really did take the global. And then we started doing, like, me and my younger brother, Mike, we started doing, um, like, conventions. So we started doing, like, comic book conventions. Um, you're from you're from New York. So do you remember the ship, the USS Intrepid, over on the west side? There was, like, this is a battleship with Oh, all by the those, South Street Seaport. Right, by the South Street Seaport, right. There's the planes on there, the yep. jets and everything. So they had a, a huge comic book convention that was there. That was my first major convention because before that we were going to smaller events and that would be at little places like the VFW. But we went there, man, and I made about $7,000 in a single day. And after that, that was it. That was you know, it. Th this, this, this makes so much sense. Amazon and Kendall, this is light work for you. Yeah, it, it is, man. Basically because we were doing it the hard way there. But at, at, at that time we were, I had to run the, my own ads, right? Had to come up with the copy, had to ship out the products, had to process the orders. With, with, with Kindle, you don't have to do any of that, right? You're coming up with the idea. And if you're not a writer, you can get someone to write the content for you. You publish it on Amazon and Amazon takes care of everything else, unless you're going to run ads and market your books. Yeah. So it's a totally different landscape. Right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this because um, some, some people already know my story, like, Last month, my because I'm a notary, my commission expired. Uh, mm -hmm. October 6th, it expired. So technically, that would put me out of business, right? Right. But because of the Kendall Cashflow course and how you 
you and your team. And by the way, you guys, he has a remarkable team. Shout out to Josh, Marty, Jawar, yeah. Rodney, everybody of the Cashflow family, uh, Kendall Cashflow family. Because of that, I was able to withstand the storm um, because a lot of people don't even have reserve or they don't have a cash flow coming in if, yeah. if they lose their stamp like that or their car goes down. Yeah, I was able to still get income coming in. And then last night, my stamp came through. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm cool. But the thing was, the, the Kendall cash flow kept me afloat while everything was going through its transition while I was renewing my, uh, my, so I wanted to thank you for that, man, because a a lot of people don't realize like in today's market, if you're not, if you don't have an online presence or you don't have what I'd like, I think you guys coined it. It was cash flow. If you don't have cash flow coming in or digital real estate, right? Digital real estate. That's what we call Kindle books. Right. But the cash flow is so important, man. So listen, I'm a big advocate of cryptocurrency, right? I invest in probably about 40 or 50 different coins. Yeah. I'm a big advocate of NFTs, right? I'm, I'm blockchain everywhere, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm all about it. Now, there's coins, there's, there's cryptocurrency that will pay you passively, right? There's coins that will generate passive income for you. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, most coins don't. Mm-hmm. So... Even though cryptocurrency is explosive, you can make a lot of money, you can have some amazing returns. If you're not picking the right coins, you don't have that passive income that's coming in, right? So you've got money that's sitting in a coin and you have to hope that it goes up. True. And now if it does go up, you can see some massive gains. But by the same token, it can also go down and you see some massive losses, right? So that's why I'm a big fan. With, with Kindle Publishing, you consistently have that passive income that's coming in. There's nothing better than having income that comes in on a regular basis, Mm. right? And this is why so many of us are addicted to working a nine to five, right? Because we know that one of the the most basic human needs is the need for certainty. Yes. Right? So the need for certainty, the need for security. So if we're working on nine to five, and like I said, Walgreens was my only job. I haven't had a job in... uh, probably about 30 almost 30 years so correct me if i get this part wrong but 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 if 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 we are used to getting paid on friday every friday right and that, that's what i mean it may have changed there's certainty in that there's security in that like we know that even if we are broke on tuesday or wednesday we know without a doubt for the most part unless accounting has screwed something up right that we're getting paid on friday that's what passive income does for you. Like, you know, with Amazon Kindle Publishing, you are getting paid every single month, yeah. right? You know that we own some real estate. We own some short-term rental properties, right? We know that if we get a renter in there, that we're getting paid, hopefully, as long as the renter don't screw up, right? Mm-hmm. That we're getting paid consistently, right? There's that passive income aspect to it. So I'm asking everyone that's watching this, like, think about how do you incorporate passive income into your lifestyle right now in the way that you're doing things? Because it gives you that peace of mind to the point where you can now go in and work on other things. Yes. Right. There's there's that certainty in passive income where I could wake up every single day. I know without a doubt that there's certain amounts of money that are, that's coming into my bank account and it makes that day to day life lots lots and lots easier it's so, right it's because so I'm, I'm not worrying about it yep so it, it, it you know, look i see the number and what i love about the the kindle cash flow community yeah. first of all you reach people all over the world i mean yeah like, we've got people everywhere every over 100 and, uh, 126 different countries all backgrounds all ages yeah. all ethnicities all religious uh yeah, it's, backgrounds it, everything it is yeah. so powerful you know um the numbers that they put on that private mastermind thing those are real numbers because you can't you can't fudge those unless you're really really good at photoshop and creative suites you're not fudging those we could we know what it looks like in the back office of amazon right and when i started seeing right like, like, like seth 
putting up numbers like 34. Yep. Seth Taylor. Yeah, you know what I mean? Seth Taylor putting up, and then the other people putting 30, 30, 30, a month, thousand right? in a month. In a month. Yep. Yep. That's Caroline Trainer, a thousand dollars a day. I think she just did like eight eighteen hundred a day, right? So you have uh, Sue White, who's at like fifteen thousand a month. Nate Mascari, he's almost at thirty thousand a month. You know, Brian Taylor, who's at like thirty thousand a month or so, twenty six thousand. I think he's at the, the nineteen year old Peter Peter Andrew. I don't know if you've seen him, right? Uh, oh, me and, wow, one of my um, my CMR. We were just talking about him. Dude is 19. He's publishing books around the subject of public public speaking, and he's making $33,000 a month, right? So at 19, so I interviewed him um, just like I interviewed you, right? So I like to interview a lot of our students that are in the community. And he said, like, that basically changes. He said two things. Number one, it changes the landscape of his his family dynamic. And then number two, he said, it's a very, it became a very awkward conversation around a dinner table because he's now making a lot more money than his father. You know what I mean? So at 19, he's making $33,000 a month, whereas his dad might be making a hundred thousand a year or so, you know, whatever it may be. Right. So that became a very, his dad's like, Hey, P- Peter, can, can you show me this, this Amazon Kindle publishing thing? You know, and it, it took a while for his father to, to believe it, right? So to believe a possibility, but he now has his father publishing. So it just changes why, the, why do you the think family it's dynamic. Right? So we have so many people under- in the community that have it. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. That's a good question. I think that no, that, that no, that's a great question, man. I think the reason why is because we're, we're used to we're, we're tangible people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we, we we like to be able to touch something. Right. We like to be able to go in and grab our books from a bookstore. We even if we don't go in and get them from a Barnes and Nobles, we still like to be able to order them from an Amazon and have a physical book that we can put on our book bag. Or we can put on our night scan stand that we can dog ear, that we can, you know, circle certain passages around. And I think that it, it becomes hard for someone to imagine someone else in another city, state or in another country on another continent, paying for something that's digital, Mm. right? Something that's intangible. I think it becomes difficult for the average person to see that, okay, someone will buy this digital product, this digital asset, my digital piece of real estate, and they'll give me the price that I'm asking for, right? Because I'm giving them the value. I think once we're able to get past the roadblock of it doesn't have to be physical. And, and that's that's where we're heading to right now, right? You, again, going back to cryptocurrency, going back to the NFTs where you have people that are paying millions of dollars for digital pieces of art. There was a piece of uh, NFT that sold the other day a couple of weeks ago for something like $18 million. Mm. A digital piece of art yeah. that you cannot hang on your wall. Right. Right? That you cannot... Uh, put in your van and transfer it to your house or somewhere you can't go in and and so that's where we're heading right where people are now starting to see the value in digital assets to the point where they're willing to pay these astronomical amounts amounts for it they're willing to go in and buy it off of a platform like amazon or open seas which is an nft marketplace um they're willing to go in and buy uh, cryptocurrency off of Coinbase, right? Which yeah. is a, a, a Coinbase or, or a cryptocurrency exchange. Mm-hmm. So you have where even the older generations are starting to say, if I don't embrace this thing now, then I'm probably going to get left behind. And I think that if, if we have to say that there was any beauty that came out of the pandemic, I mm-hmm. think that was it. It was the fact that so many people were locked away so many people were at home so many people were kind of forced to embrace technology so many people were forced to get used to being online for, to doing meetings on zoom on platforms like this right mm-hmm. to uh attending meetings through go to meeting to learning how to shop on amazon I, I spoke to a lady the other day who had said the first time she ever shopped was during the pandemic on amazon 
She said she always thought she was skeptical, but she was forced to because she couldn't go out and she couldn't go hit Walmart up for something, right? So Amazon was her 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 directory, right? That was where she was able to go. Yeah. And she says since then she's probably ordered about 40 or 50 other things. So the pandemic, the last couple of years have forced more people online and more people out of their zones of comfort. Like, listen, my some of our best years Mm -hmm. were over the last couple of years yes because more people are now being open to coming in and buying online right so um and i kind of saw that early on i i kind of we did a talk for our kindle cash flow community where um i told people i said that there's going to be lots of negatives that come out of this thing but there's also going to be lots of positives and you have to position yourself right now so that you can take advantage of those positives and some of the positives are going to be people jumping on these computers and on these phones and saying i have to figure this out now right just as we saw where we went through the industrial age right where people were having to figure things out at that point we have now this huge, mass amount of people that are connected globally that are figuring things out all together. And that's why we're starting to see this massive transfer of wealth. We're starting to see this massive exposure to education. We're starting to see where people are embracing um, less of formal education and more of self-education because there's so many different routes, like things like this. Yes. Right, like your platform. So, so I think, I think we, we we just at the tip of it right now. So, what do you what do you foresee, right? Like with with the crypto, because I started dabbling in crypto myself. Like today, I actually nominated it Crypto Tuesdays. Right, so those are the days that I just completely immerse myself into crypto. I'm buying Saitama. I'm buying you know Shiba. I'm buying it all. Right. Oh. So, um, right. What What do you foresee in, in the next three to five years? Now, I think that in the next three to five years, I think right now for everything from everything digital, right? So all of these digital assets that we're talking about, did, did we lose you? Oh, yeah, there you I'm go. Here. All right. Perfect. So for all of the digital assets that we're talking about, whether it's digital um, courses, so putting together your own digital training programs like the Kindle Cashflow program that I have whether it's you publishing uh, digital products like Kindle books, whether you investing in cryptocurrency or NFTs, right now it is the most difficult that it's ever going to be to do. Mm. So, and I say that because, listen, I was on um, Binance US, right? Which is a Mm. cryptocurrency exchange. And then I was on um, just a couple of other sites. I was on Bittrex and I'm, looking at some of these different exchanges and it is amazingly difficult to understand initially when you jump on when you're trying to buy a coin right you you have to exchange um us money or fiat right for usdt or usdc and then with that you can go in you can buy ethereum or you can go in and buy a bitcoin or you can buy directly from the exchange if you're going to use your bank account or your credit card but right now, it's super difficult for most people that are coming in to go it in is. and buy a single piece of uh, Shiba, it single is. coin. I think that within the next year or two, these platforms, these exchanges are going to go in and make it so much easier, just like Amazon has made it super easy for people to go in and buy anything. You go in, your credit card's already in file, you hit a button and boom. Two days later, because you're a Prime member, you now have it at your door. Sometimes a day later, sometimes even the same day. Mm -hmm. So the exchanges haven't figured that part out yet. How do we make this easier? Super easy, two button click easy. And when you have two button click easy taking place, that's when you see massive adoption take place. And when massive adoption takes place, where my aunt, May, who I'm here in Philadelphia visiting, who's 83, can pick up her phone and say, okay, I'm going to go on Coinbase and I want to buy Shiba. Click, yeah. click. That's when prices are really going skyrocket. So all of us that are in right now, we start to see these massive gains because we're figuring out, on, we're figuring out the difficult sides of things. Right? Where there's maybe, 
hundreds of millions of people that are involved right now. Yeah. But imagine when there's billions of people that are involved. But there's a limited amount of currency coin wise. Exactly. Right. So now that demand drives things up even more so. I was so I would say buddy, to anyone. <clears throat> oh, go ahead. I was telling my buddy that this is our stock market of our era. This 100%. is the, this is this is our Nasdaq New York yep. Stock Exchange. This is your your chance to get in and uh, get in at Amazon stock, right? Or uh, um, what else is out there? Tesla, right? Or Google at a dollar. Yeah. Or to get into Walmart, right? At 50 cents. This is your chance now. Now, there's going to be some major winners. There's going to be some major lo losers as well. But so now we're talking about cryptocurrency, right? I want to bring that back to when I was talking about passive income. Mm hmm because the passive income, getting into something like Kindle Publishing, where you have this passive income that comes in, allows you to fuel your, your cryptocurrency investments, right? So having that passive income that comes in, because you've gone in, you've published 10 or 20 different books on Amazon Kindle, and you have this income that's coming in every single month, you can now go in and use dollar cost averaging to invest in cryptocurrency every single month or every single week or however frequent you want to do so. But that doesn't happen until you have a passive income streams that are coming in, right? So that you're not taking out of your own personal income, but you're using, see, the rich understand that using money to make money is the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. Not using your money that you have to go and you pay your mortgage or if you pay your bills, or, but using money that is there and that's continuously coming in to put into other forms of income that's going or other forms of assets that's going to make you money. So you have two different things. You've got Kindle publishing that's going to generate you this passive income that's coming in month by month by month. And you're taking a portion of that, not all of it, because you want to put some back into your business. Right. And then you've taken a portion of that and you're putting it into your cryptocurrency investments or your NFT investments or your real estate, your physical real estate investments, which is what I did, right? Or your short-term real estate investments. And now those create other streams of income that come in. These could be your long-term investment strategies, where if you would have invested in Amazon 20 years ago, right? And now 20 years later, you can cash out. Yeah, big time. Right? So I always tell people like, to look at it, there's going to be several ways that you make the most out of your money. The first is taking your job, your nine to five job, and building out this passive stream of income. And that is Kindle Publishing. That's the easiest thing to get involved with, right? You can get started for a couple of hundred bucks. Kindle Publishing. Now get that up to the point where it's generating passive recurring revenue that's coming in every single month. And then now what you do is you put more money into that thing, more money into your business. That's mm -hmm. what got me to the point where with Kindle Publishing, I could do forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month because I got to a point where I said, okay, well, I'm going to take $5,000 out of this and put it back into my business because it's already working, right? So if it's already working, do more of what's already working. It's like what I was talking about with the um, comic book ads. Mm -hmm. If it's working for me in one publication, go in and advertise in another, yeah. then advertise in another. So with Kindle Publishing, you've got one book, go in and publish another book. If that book is making you 500 bucks a month, go in and publish another book. Then take proceeds from that, publish another book and keep flipping it. Keep a term that we used back in the day, right? Keep flipping it, keep putting it back in there. And then now once you are at a place where you're making a thousand bucks a month or $5,000 a month, now you start taking a portion of that, 2,000 a month and put it into cryptocurrency or the stock market using dollar cost averaging. So now every single month or every single week or every two weeks, you're buying certain coins or certain stocks and you're buying them whether they're up or whether they're down, right? Whether they're high or whether they're low, whether there's a bull market or whether there's a bear market. And you let that be your long-term strategy. Don't go in and try to flip every day or day trade or any of that other craziness because it'll drive you nuts emotionally. But take that money and say, okay, this is my long-term plan. I'm going to invest in Bitcoin or Ethereum or Solana or any of the other coins that are out there, right? 
um, and say, I'm going to let this thing ride for the next five years, the next 10 years. I'm going to put some of this money away for my two-year-old. So that in 20 years, years he or she is, she's a billion, she's a millionaire already and she doesn't even know it, right? So thinking about it from different standpoints, man, that alone is going to create more millionaires and it already has over the next couple of years and more billionaires faster than we've ever seen before. I guarantee you over the next year or two, we're going to see a higher rate of millionaires and billionaires than ever before. And it's because of these new, these new asset classes, right? These new ways for people to generate income. So, and ladies and gentlemen, things are changing, man. That is why he is the outlet. That's why he supplies me with the weight. He got the weight. He just gave you so much valuable information on just being an entrepreneur, a better businessman. Trust me, if you look into his Kendall cash flow, it's on a whole nother level, you guys. I, I, I can't even explain it. Don't even want to give out the secrets, but there's only two people that, that really taught me scale since I've been alive. And that's you and Donnie. Donnie showed me wow. how to scale wow. when it comes to email marketing. Like I, I was so used to being the one-on-one salesperson. He showed me right. I can sell through email. And it worked. And then when I started wow. getting that email money, I was like, okay. You showed me how to scale on just on, on a business side of things where it was like, damn, I could transfer this same information into my notary business, transfer it into this business, transfer right. it into that's how okay. I was able to get twenty eight books in one year. Because of that. That's, and that is scale. impressive. Yeah. That's so I want I wanted to thank I, you. So much for, yeah, for I, I, this information, brother. I think we got a little bit of a lag going on. Yeah, so let me know. It might be a bit of a but delay. The, the, the last thing I want to leave with people is, listen, go in and set up a passive stream of income. It will change your life like ever, like like nothing else. D- to see that, and all, of it, all it takes is that first dollar, right? To see that you published a book on Amazon Kindle and someone has bought that book from you and you've made seven bucks or five bucks or four bucks. I'm not asking you to say, you know, let me wait until I've made 400 or 4,000 or 400,000. Let that first $1 come in. And I guarantee you that it will totally change the way that you think about passive income. You'll start hunting for additional ways to generate passive income. Mm-hmm. Listen, we're, we're I'm sitting in the hotel room right now and I'm making money. Passive Right, making money passively, whether it's through Kindle books or whether it's through cryptocurrency, whether it's through one of our real estate properties. Um, there's so many different things that are changing right now, and I'm urging you to go in and educate yourself on the many ways that are doing it, even real estate investing. Right, so long term versus short term real estate investing. Long term meaning you have long term renters that are in there that are renting your property for a year, two years, and they're paying you month to month. Versus short-term rental properties, right? We've got some short-term rental properties and we're building out a couple of more cabins out in Tennessee right now in Smoky Mountains mm. where people come in for um, a week and they pay you 2000 They pay you $3,000 to stay in your property. Now, we rent properties where we have a, a new person that comes in every single week, right? So depending on the season, sometimes it might be 1000 bucks a week. Sometimes it might be $3,000 a week. But let's say it's in the middle of the summer and it's $3,000 a week. That's our, our going rate. Our rate. We've got a property in Myrtle Beach where that's what we charge. In one month, you've got what? $12,000, right? $12,000 versus if we were to rent that out as a long-term rental property. Mm-hmm. And let's say at most we were able to get what? $3,000 a month for it. Right. So do you see how things are changing? So renting it on Airbnb or Verbal, Versus renting it out long term, you now are able to get four times the amount of income that comes in. Huge so just difference. educating yourself on the it's a huge difference, right? So now everything, I mean, there's so much that's changing right now to the point where it becomes easier to make significant amounts of money as long as you're willing to study, to kind of relearn unlearn what it is that you currently know, relearn, and then put in the work. 
And that's it. That's the formula. Study, unlearn, relearn, put in the work. And that's it. Hey, brother, uh-huh. this has been amazing. I appreciate Thank you, you so much for man. having me on. I, I really appreciate yeah. you guys Likewise. got to hear the GOAT, man. Um, how can they get in touch with you, Ty? Or they they definitely yeah, gotta go to KendallCashflow.com for sure. Yeah, so go over to KendallCashflow.com. So I'm gonna give access to everyone that's watching this. Um, a couple of things, as a matter of fact. So I've got a book out. It's a new book called Kindle Publishing Secrets, where I teach you the entire process of Kindle publishing. So not only from my viewpoint, right? Because there's a few different approaches that you could take. So what I did was I took my viewpoint and I put in what works for me into this book. And then I also went in and I interviewed my some of my top coaches. So guys like Marty, Josh, Rodney. And I said, hey guys, give me your best secrets, your best tips, your most effective measurements for um, building out or most effective methods, I should say, for building out successful Kindle publishing businesses. So I put what they shared with me in this book as well. And then I took some of my top students, guys like the Seth Taylor, um, Caroline Trainer, Sue White, um, Nate Mascari, and interviewed them and say, hey, give me your best of the best. And then I took that and I put it into this book as well. So you're getting multiple, right, experiences from people that do really well with Kindle publishing, all distilled into one book. You can get a copy for free over at kindlecashflow.com. I'm also going to give you another book that's over there. I'm not going to mention it. It'll be a surprise right now. And then you can also go in and watch a video training where um, I teach you the entire three-step process to Kindle publishing. So if you're someone that's more of a visual learner like myself, Mm -hmm. um, you can go in and you can watch that video and then um, you'll learn. Oh, one more thing. So we have our Kindle Cashflow Live event that's coming up in January. So if you're someone that is more kinesthetic, right? That's it. Go in and go to kcflive.com. So kcflive.com. You can get a free ticket there because you're watching this. And at this event, we get thousands of people across the planet that come in and we're teaching them Kindle publishing all together. And it's just a great community. So kcflive.com and kindlecashflow.com. All right. And I'll make sure all the links are in there for everybody. So yeah, thank you so much, Ty, for being on here. I really appreciate it. You are the GOAT. Continue to do great, brother. I am rooting for you. I'm a big cheerleader because I'm part of the team. <laughs> and, Likewise, brother. And I, I'll talk absolutely, to you soon, brother. Absolutely. Thank I you, everybody, for tuning in, too. I appreciate this platform. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you.